Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, and it's my pleasure to speak on behalf of, my, uh, of our team that we've assembled here. Um, the title of our project is Surveillance of the Frontlines, uh, Prevalence of Undetected COVID-19 Amongst Healthcare Providers at UCIMC. Um, and this is a truly um, a team effort between myself, um, Dr. Bender from the School of Nursing, Dr. Shin from the School of Nursing, Dr. Wodars from the School of Public Health, and Dr. Minin from Statistics. And um, of course, Dr. Buckmeyer is our consultant since he is Mr. Coronavirus. Um, so the goals of our project are to address two main questions. Question one is, what is the risk and epidemiology of COVID-19 infection in healthcare providers who are working in high-risk uh, settings? And then question two um, is, uh, what are the dynamics of exposures that predict acquisition of immunological memory to SARS-CoV-2 amongst um, healthcare providers? Um, and these are two questions that really, at the moment, remain largely um, unanswered because there are no large systematic studies in healthcare providers at the moment. Um, and so we're trying to address these two questions in the following three aims. Um, aim one, we're going to determine the prevalence of um, in, an, in, an incidence of subclinical SARS-CoV-2 infection in healthcare providers. And aim two, um, we will assess the level of pre-existing immunological memory to SARS-CoV-2, um, as well as its acquisition over time. And I'll go into more details in the next slide. And then aim three is to then use these two pieces uh, two data sets uh, to model the dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 spread and acquisition of immunity in healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. And so our study design is um, a longitudinal study design. Um, we are aiming to recruit between 100 and 200 healthcare workers who are working on the COVID-19 wards, um, the ICU and the emergency department. Um, once these subjects are recruited, we are hoping to uh, be able to collect both uh, nasopharyngeal swabs as well as blood samples longitudinally for the first six months. After the first six months, we will go to sampling every three months. Um, and we will use these samples to address two questions. Um, so of course, from the swabs, we will extract RNA and we will run a, a, an RTQ-PCR to look for virus. Um, and of course, there's a bifurcation. Um, so if we uh, find positive samples that um, we will uh, try to isolate and sequence the virus so that we can place this in the phylogeny of all the SARS-CoV-2 um, isolates that are circulating in, current, uh, in Orange County. Um, we actually have another project um, in collaboration with the Public Health Laboratory in Orange County where we are sequencing um, viral strains. And this is not only an effort between UCI and Orange County Public Health Labs, but also the CDC. And of course, the high throughput genomic score facility here is in being incredibly supportive. But we have over 120 positive samples that we are um, sequencing in order to place our viral strains into a phylogenetic tree. Um, if we do find positive samples, we'll also use them to look at viral growth curves because we are targeting individuals who are, um, who are not showing overt symptoms of disease. That, that is one of our um, exclusion criteria is if people are symptomatic, they, they cannot be enrolled in the study. Um, and so it will be very interesting to know uh, what those viruses look like compared to the original Wuhan strain and then um, the Italy strain um, and some of the more uh, earlier strains. So the questions that we want to ask are, is the virus adapting to the human population and, and um, actually getting attenuated over time, um, which would not be out of step with most other um, epidemics that we see. Um, and then the blood samples will be used to look for antibody titers. Um, we will use a multiple, multiple steps for serology here. Um, so these are just um, antibody, um, uh, we'll measure antibody titers using good old fashioned ELISA. Um, we will first look for antibody titers using the nucleocapsid protein as our screening antigen. Um, and then any samples that score positive here will undergo a second ELISA using the RBD domain of the S protein. And the reason why we're doing this sequentially is that we already have preliminary data that shows that the N protein in our hands at least has about a 10% false positive rate, whereas the RBD domain seems to have very, we have in the 100 negative samples that we've screened so far, we don't see any false positives. Um, and then any um, samples that show positive antibody titers, 
we will then validate whether these antibodies have any effective function by doing a neutralization assay. So um, together with the help of EHNS and um, Gary Landucci, who is the director of the BSL-3 lab, we are setting up the BSL-3 facility here in order for us to be able to do these neutralizing assays. So we'll have some idea about whether um, these antibody titers actually are in any way correlated with um, neutralizing potential. Um, as well, if we find individuals who have antibody titers, then um, the PBMC fraction from these blood samples will be subjected to an interferon gamma LE spot um, assay, and that is to look for T cell responses. Um, so we are proposing to do these LE spots using an overlapping peptide library for the entire proteome of this virus. Um, these studies are super important because they will inform us about which regions and which proteins of the virus are highly immunogenic and could there be good components for uh, vaccine development. Um, the way to make vaccines, you can go with um, live attenuated, the whole virus, or fully inactivated virus. Um, and there, another approach is to use recombinant DNA and actually express specific regions of the virus that we know to be highly immunogenic. Um, those types of vaccines tend to be more um, uh, it, uh, desired for people who are immunocompromised and, and vulnerable populations who, who may not be good candidates for a live attenuated virus, for example. Now, depending on um, the data and how many positive samples we may uh, detect over the course of this 12-month study, um, then uh, Dr. Woodraz and Yunin will use their skills to develop a mathematical model of the spread of COVID-19 through um, actually the larger human population using uh, a modification of a standard susceptible infected recovered protocol. Um, and Dr. Minin will also be able to use the sequence of the viruses to study evolution of the virus. Um, these, um, so not only do we think this is very important because our healthcare providers need to be surveilled in a longitudinal manner, and we need to get a better understanding of how we are developing herd immunity and what are truly the rates of the subclinical shedding that occurs. We, I'm sure everybody has heard a lot about these asymptomatic shedders. Um, I am one of those very big skeptics. Um, I think symptomatic the, the definition of symptomatic is highly subjective and some people have higher tolerance for discomfort than others. So I prefer to refer to this as subclinical shedding, but that is a really largely unanswered question at the moment. And I think that's really important for that. Um, in terms of future experiments- Okay, so we are- This is on my last slide, Susan. Okay, great. Um, so in terms of what we can do with these samples as well, if we do have individuals who are acutely shedding, um, then this um, gives us a, a, actually a very unique opportunity to look at the host response in people who are not symptomatic. Uh, most of the studies that are published so far are mostly focused on individuals who are in the ICU or are in the hospital, so very, very sick patients. And we have very few studies that have looked at individuals who are not requiring, don't even know that they're sick. And so um, we, can, we can do those studies. And also we are hoping to do some BCR, B cell receptor sequencing in order to identify good B cell clones that could be used for um, making monoclonal antibodies um, uh, for convalescent um, zero type of approaches. So I will end there. Thank you. So could the next speaker, and we are switching at this point to Andre, is that right? Could you go ahead and get your slides up and time for one question? Well, this is Tully, can I ask one? Please. So um, you're making, I assume, this just sounds wonderful and again, um, uh, thanks. Um, but you're making an assumption, I guess, that the rate of conversion of your healthcare providers will be pretty low. Because if you start off recruiting 100 or 150, and you have 50, 60% of them converting, which may be a case in a very you know, acute frontline situation, then you really might be losing quite a bit of your ability to look at the dynamics. Will you be recruiting more, or how are you going to handle that? Yes, I mean, we would love to recruit more. Um, at, at the moment, we just wanted to at least deploy it with this initial 100 and 150 workers, and um, we will be analyzing data in real time and seeing what, I mean, I'd like to first a snapshot of even if we recruit 150 people, how many of them could be potentially subclinically shedding, how many of them have pre-existing immunity, and that would actually inform the next stages of the study. But I am very, very keen on taking this data and submitting for an NIH grant to do larger studies amongst healthcare providers, not only here, but I'm also in discussions with colleagues in Palm Springs who are seeing very different kinds of uh, patients over there. And it's a 
completely different acute situations because there's more comorbidities because of the Sultan C, there's more pre-existing conditions, especially lung diseases, and of course, individuals living with HIV. So those healthcare providers are facing completely different kinds of challenges. And so we're definitely looking to build on this model and not only look at UCIMC, but also other um, healthcare settings as well. Thank you, Tali.